Dorgan Floyd, uh, John Lund, and Phil Eklund. And uh, we're going to start off with uh, Jorgen Floyd, who is going to talk about the uh, uh, the battle uh, in the Norwegian coastal waters during World War II, which is a subject that's a neglected part of a, a neglected area. So, uh, and Jorgen is well known to people of the in the Norwegian History Roundtable. He's written a dozen books on history and historical topics, mostly Scandinavian and Norwegian. And uh, we are happy to uh, present him as our speaker. And uh, if you can unmute yourself and continue the presentation. Well, hi, everybody. I hope uh, I come through fine, sound-wise. The, um, there were really four parts of the Navy and Merchant Marine of, the, of Norway during the war. It was the uh, big Merchant Marine, the, the one that traveled within Europe and uh, most of the United States, but even down in, in uh, Japan, etc. And that's the one that uh, my two co-speakers will talk about, and which was the most important part, uh, Norway's most important contribution to to the World War II uh, victory. Uh, the other thing is the pure Norwegian Navy, and that's not the subject for today, but it's uh, obviously what that's all about. And then there was a small unit, which also is quite famous. And that, of course, was what is uh, today popularly called uh, or termed the Shetland bus. And that was basically, it started out with fishing boats going between the west coast of Norway and the Shetland Islands, and bringing um, refugees and agents and back and forth equipment. And uh, that uh, lasted throughout the war years. And again, that's, um, that's been covered quite extensively in Norway because it was, of course, an extremely dangerous uh, uh, service. And uh, I think it's also seen for Norway as a seafaring nation with a lot of small communities that, as a almost romantic, part of the war. You know, it was these guys going in their fishing boats and traveling back and forth. And, you know, and of course, they were targeted by German aircraft, because if you were more than a certain distance from the Norwegian coast, it was obviously where you were going. <clears throat> so all these three parts are reasonably famous, I think. The one thing you hear very little about today, it's, it's changed a little bit the last five, 10 years. And that's the what we in Norway termed the home fleet. Now the away fleet or, or out, out fleet actually, if you take a direct, trans, a direct translation, uh, is the one, as I mentioned, that was not in Norwegian harbors when the Germans attacked. And then with a couple of very small exceptions, they all joined the Allied cause. But there was also a, a number of uh, ships, uh, a couple of hundred ships that were in Norwegian harbors and obviously uh, were captured by the Germans. Now, they continued to sail throughout the war, up and down the Norwegian coast. It was very dangerous. Uh, they were smaller, by and large, uh, than uh, the Atlantic uh, ships, for, for obvious reasons, uh, small harbors, etc. Uh, but they were extremely important. They were very important for the Norwegian population, because northern Norway, as, as uh, I'm sure almost all, probably all of you know, cannot grow its own food. You know, you, this uh, farming in Northern Norway, is, uh, it's not a big, uh, especially back then, was not a very uh, good profession. So you had the fishing, and of course the Germans were interested in, in the cod liver oil, and the oil, um, <clears throat> especially for the submarine crews. Um, but it was also necessary for the Norwegian population in the North, because as I said, one, they needed food, and uh, there's no other way to get it. Uh, in those days, the roads going north were extremely bad. Even today, they're not great, but well, actually they've become quite nice the last 20 years. But in those days, it was very tough. And of course, petrol was a almost constant shortage uh, for the German forces. So uh, you couldn't really just jump in a truck and fill it up and, and go north. The train didn't go very far. It goes to Trondheim. Um, but that was it, and you know, you're not even halfway up the Norwegian coast when you're in Trondheim. 
So um, the the railway that today goes up to New uh, Tromsø doesn't didn't exist then. It was actually started and to a certain extent not completed, but almost completed by the Germans. So the coastal traffic was very important for, for the Norwegian population in the north, and it was important also for the Germans, because up in the north they had the Lapland army, which of course was initially in the beginning of the war fighting with the Finns, and then when switch, uh, Finland switched sides, uh, they had to be supplied from Norway. That was the only way. They couldn't come any other way. So um, it was a traffic that was necessary for both parties. And uh, the Allies, of course, were very aware of that, and they were fighting for their lives. So uh, they had to; they felt they had to target these ships. And of course, as we do, with the, and this this was not only something done by the Germans, by the way. The Allies did some of the same things. You know, we know Lusitania had a lot of military equipment, even though they refused to say so in the beginning. So um, it was uh, it was a um, Difficult task also for some of the crews because they knew that when they sank some of these ships, they uh, would also kill civilians in most cases because a lot of the ships were, were um, uh, combined, you know, they had freight and passengers. And of course, the passenger ships were Hurti Ruten, for those of you who have taken it, uh, existed back then. And nine ships of these, uh, of the Hurti Ruten ships, which are passenger ships, with some load capacity also by all means, uh, were sunk. There were about 300 Norwegian civilians and about 700 Norwegian sailors who died on the, uh, on the Norwegian coast. Most of them were killed by the Allied forces, which included all the Norwegian forces. Now, in the beginning, um, this, the sabotage against the, or the, the effort to stop this this traffic wasn't as big uh, because one, it wasn't as critical in the beginning, but then as the war one went on, and of course, especially after the attack on the Soviet Union, it, things changed completely. And uh, it was really driven by, there were three ways they really attacked them. One was submarines, which was not a big thing, but uh, one of the first Norwegian submarines actually that sunk was sunk not far off the Norwegian coast by a German destroyer. Uh, so that was the one thing. The second thing is what you see on this picture, which is motor torpedo boats. In the beginning, they had some very old and two small boats. They bought some English boats. And the first one actually was captured by the Germans. And uh, in um, a sad episode, actually, the, all the, the crews, even though they were, they were in uniform, etc., were, they were executed by the Germans. Uh, then they got the more modern equipment, but this is one of them. And what they did was they would race across, uh, unlike this, the, the sh fishing boats, which I mentioned, which took agents, which were going slow and so on. These things were obviously quite fast. They would typically go, they would operate mostly in winter time or fall and spring. It was very difficult in the middle of the summer because it's almost 24 hour uh, daylight, daylight, even in, in southern Norway. So, um, they would go over at night. They will would find a place to hide. And if you take the next picture, Bill. Okay. Uh, this is actually a picture of two torpedo boats camouflaged on the Norwegian coast. And as you can see, they were not e easy to see. And remember, the the uh, Germans had limited ray, and even the I think even the Allied radars wouldn't have really worked very well in, in those conditions. So they could hide out like that. Then if they caught a freighter or a ship like that and they decide to sink them, they would basically sit there, shoot the torpedoes, and then floor it and race back to England. Um, because they, they couldn't um, fight. The, you know, these sh ships are really built for... Uh, I wouldn't say it's almost stealth operations. You know, you you hit and you run. You you can't stay and fight. They're very thinly skinned. You know, even very light ammunition would go through it. So that was the one thing. The second thing which started, or the third, sorry, first was the submarines was uh, the air force, and um, they have sent off flights from um, England. And uh, the next picture. And in the beginning, they used all sorts of plates. They used uh, 
some uh, lucky load stars, etc. Most of them were not very suited because it was a bit of a distance and uh, they couldn't really, until very late in the war, they couldn't really give cover to these uh, bombers, light bombers. So losses could be quite heavy. And they sent them out typically two or three and they would um, fly over to the coast, hit in a target, and often they would have radio communication, which had somebody had, uh, you know, they had been uh, told that the German, there were some ships in this and this area. And if you go to YouTube, there's an uh, excellent uh, film there, footage uh, um, from an attack in Olesen Harbor. And, you know, it's right there in the harbor, so it must have been quite a spectacle for, uh, for the people of that place. Uh, later in the war, and especially in 1944, they created something which was called the Banff Strike Wing. Banff is a place both in England and in, in Canada, as, uh, as you probably know. And um, they had two types of planes uh, that were most used. One was the British Boar Fighters, and the other one was the de Havilland Mosquito. Now, this is Norwegian Mosquito, but it's pictures from after the war. But it was the same type and uh, actually the same planes, the ones that survived. And uh, the Norwegian crews, there was uh, one of the three squadrons of Banff squ uh, striking was Norwegian. And the Norwegian crews were very much uh, uh, the guides. So they would lead because they knew the coast. A lot of these guys knew the coastline. So they could they would take the, uh, the British flights with them and then they would hit these harbors and then they would run back to England. And uh, often it went well. You know, the, the, the anti-aircraft uh, fire from the German ships were quite, uh, quite strong, so they had a fairly high loss rate. In the big scheme of things, when you look about these big bomb rates and so on, of course it wasn't that many, but percentage-wise for the crews, they had a high uh, loss rate. And the Mosquito was very fast. It was actually as fast as the German fighters. So if they managed to surprise the enemy and attack and then start going back, they had a good chance of surviving. So by 1944, the Norwegian uh, West Coast was really an intense battlefield. And the um, Admiral der Norwegische Westkuste, the uh, German admiral for the uh, West Coast of Norway, he, had, uh, he got daily reports about all the uh, activity on the West Coast. Because the Germans, they had a lot of smaller ships, trawlers, rebuilt ships, etc. <clears throat> They couldn't fight the destroyers and things like that, but inside the Norwegian coast, uh, they had very heavy anti-aircraft uh, equipment, and they could also fight off some of these lighter boats, you know, in a, in a battle. So this, um, so this, uh, um, I think one of the reasons why this battle hasn't been that uh, much talked about it is now. One was it, it was quite emotional in Norway because I, when they sank these ships, there was a fair uh, number of Norwegian uh, civilians who, who were killed also, of course. Um, it was also, same with the boats, they lost, uh, um, I think I wrote it down someplace. Uh, there was something like uh, a couple of hundred that went down. They, they had about, there was about 833 ships about, it was 833 ships that were part of the so-called home fleet that was in Norwegian harbors, and a quarter of them were lost. So uh, I think that's part of it, and of course it wasn't as, as important for the Allies' war effort as obviously the uh, out, outside fleet or the international fleet, whatever you want to call them. Uteflotten sounds good in Norwegian, but it sounds a bit strange in English. So, um, so that's, I think that's part of the reason why this is probably the least known battle, even though it was a very intense battle. Um, it was important then, of course. Uh, they also had these ships when, uh, as you know, when the Russians moved into Finn, Mark up from Finland, um, they had to, they, the Germans uh, burnt down, the, well, basically burnt down Finn, Mark, you know, the, uh, which wasn't common in those days or even in previous wars to, to burn out everything so the conqueror wouldn't have anything to use. Uh, and the, the way they could be, could be evacuated was really by ships. So um, it is, uh, 
it might be probably the least known part of the sort of the four legs of the naval sphere that uh, that Norway was involved in. So I think that's a little introduction, but uh, it's um, it's a little uh, it's an interesting part of, of the, the war. There's any questions, or how do you want to do it, Bill? Do you want questions? Do you want? Oh, we have questions first of all. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, Jorgen. Yeah. I, I, uh, Wayne Lindbergh. I had a question. The patrol boat that you have pictured here looks very much like an American PT boat. Were those supplied by the Americans to the Norwegians? No. Uh, during the, most of the, uh, during the war, it was mostly. Uh, well, this may be an. I think that's the number five. I think that was one of the first boats they got. They were built in Britain. Uh, after the war, they had some English ones. The only American ships uh, that were supplied were this, the three. Um, it was actually uh, sub hunters that were used for the Shetland bus from 1943. Because in 1943, the losses on the ships going back and forth with these agents and refugees and so on. Uh, were too slow, and they had a very high loss rate in 1940. It was so high actually that they had to stop them. And then um, the, the U.S. Navy transferred three sub hunters to the U.S. To, to the Norwegian Navy, and they were actually at that stage they also became a, officially a part of the Navy. Originally, that was a part of the Merchant Marine. And uh, those three sub hunters were really excellent, and they didn't lose any of them, and uh, which I'm very happy about because uh, I may not have been there if they did, because my dad escaped on one of them, and then he joined the commanders, and then he was shipped back to Norway uh, a year later, and uh, also with one of those sub hunters. And uh, yeah, he said that uh, you know the the great thing was he survived. He said the other thing was that they were awful which if you he said he was so seasick they tied him <laughs> to the mast so or to one of the mast so he wouldn't jump overboard he was just so seasick strange thing was that later in life he uh, he we always had a boat so but uh, that, that those were the american ships the the uh, torpedo boats used during the war were um, uh, all from uh, british uh, yeah most of them by wasper which was a big uh, MTB manufactured back in, in the 40s. Now, can I just say something? Hello? Yeah, sure. Um, um, uh, I should say my, my great grandfather was a Norwegian uh, merchant seaman back in the 19th century. He came to America through Ellis Island and uh, later wound up as a farmer in Iowa. I think he was a better seaman than he was a farmer. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, so I did a term paper about the Norwegian Merchant Marine in the, in the World War, in the Second World War, and uh, there was a, a claim in one of the books that I read, and I wonder if you can uh, uh, refute this or, or uh, confirm it. According to this claim, um, the Norwegian Merchant Marine in the first three years of the war, that is 39 to 42 thereabouts, carried into Great Britain one third of the foodstuffs and one half of the petroleum that the British needed. And, um, and so that the Battle of Britain was fought to a large extent with uh, gasoline uh, brought in by the Norwegian uh, tankers. Can you confirm or, or, uh, or deny the, that? The, uh, the, the gas, uh, at least in 1940-41, uh, before the U.S. really got into the war on, on a bigger scale. Um, but in 41, 42, or 40, 41, uh, something like a third or 40 percent of the aviation fuel that was sent to Britain during Battle of Britain, among other things, was carried on Norwegian uh, ships. Because the Norwegian ships were, they were quite modern, and a lot of them were tankers. The food stuff, I, I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe John or... Uh, uh, one of the other guys will know the percentages there. But the, the gasoline is, I know, is correct. Well, the other thing that I learned in this is that the Norwegian Merchant Marine was the fourth largest in the world. That's correct. Before the war started, the fourth largest in the world. And um, it, it was, as you say, Norway's largest contribution to the Allies in World War II. And that was a big contribution, especially 
as you noted before, America got involved, but one half of it was lost in the course of the war, mainly uh, to German U-boats. And, uh, and this actually was, I'm sorry, do you have something on that? Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I was going to say, I, I think the percentage of ships were less than 50%. I know that it was about 10% of the crews died, but the, again, John or may have something about that. When he, when he will talk about the outer or the international fleet, let's call it that. That's a better word in English. Okay. Uh, think, yeah. Well, yeah, we're going other... to, that's a good question. We're going, uh, John and Phil are going to be talking about that a little later on. And uh, but that is a significant point that we're going to be bringing up later. Okay, that's good. Uh, Go ahead, just, uh, Jorgen. Just one question. Now, when you talk about the uh, what was the um, uh, what was being shipped into Norway and what was being shipped out of Norway by the Germans uh, after the occupation. Well, it changed a little bit, you know, in the beginning, of course, uh, iron ore was an important thing uh, that after Fe they conquered France and Belgium, that became not quite as important because um, the German mines, sorry, the, the Swedish mines can produce something like 1,800 1, tons so, of steel once they got, and, and that was a big deal. Back in 1940, but after France and, and the Dutch, you know, the, the Ben Lux and so on fell, um, the Germans got control of 14,000 tons of steel production in those countries. So that, of course, was much more important. Um, the other thing, well, it was food stuff going north, and it was people and and also not only to Norwegian but also to the German German army stationed in the north. So that, that was an important thing. And then there was, uh, there was also, you know, coal and things like that, that, that would go up and down the coast. I mean, Northern Norway needed a lot. Northern Norway traditionally had fish and a few other things, you know. Today it's very different, but back then, um, very par big part of Norwegian export was, was fish. Actually, it's still a very big uh, export. Okay. Can I just say, uh, say something? Um, the main reason that Germany invaded Norway was to get control over the ice-free port of Narvik, which was the year-round um, port for shipping Swedish iron ore. And Swedish iron ore was Germany's main source of iron ore for both world wars. And um, the Germans uh, wanted, they had to take control of that. And so they invaded Norway and uh, had control of that. I think that was the main, the main reason I, for being there. Go ahead. That, that's discussed, but I don't think so. Um, because as I said, it was, it was important in the beginning, but the part of the German forces or the German administration that argued for attacking Norway, first and foremost was the German Navy, the Kriegsmarine. And the reason was that in First World War, remember that this was before France fell, um, they attacked Norway two months before they attacked France and, and Benelux. And at that stage, there was really a replay of World War I. And in World War I, because the French coast, of course, is south of England, you can't launch anything on the channel because it would be picked up right away. So they only had that short stretch from, from the end of the, uh, the, the uh, uh, from Benelux up to the Danish border. That was the only place they could launch ships. And in World War I, the British fleet had to completely blockaded that. And the, the German Navy was very aware of that. And of course, they didn't want the repetition. And they also had all these submarines. And if they, it would have been very easy for the British if they could only send them out for one place. Now, of course, again, so they took Norway and Denmark, and then they avoided that problem. Suddenly, they had an enormous uh, coast. I mean, Norway, Norway has essentially half the Norwegian, their European um, Western coastline. So they had an enormous uh, coastline, long coastline, which would be very almost impossible for the for the, the British Navy to or any navy to blockade. And on top of that, of course, then a little bit later, they also got the French ports. So then they had everything from Spain up to uh, North Cape. So the British couldn't repeat that uh, blockade. So the, so the German Navy was the biggest, they were the ones who were most in, uh, adamant that they should attack North. 
Iron ore was certainly important. And again, um, especially in the beginning, but then, as I said, from uh, 1941, the 1800, uh, 18,000 ton of uh, uh, Swedish ore was dwarfed about 10 to 1 by the iron ore production that you found in, in France and uh, some of these other countries. So Belgium of, course they, of course, they didn't know that when they invaded Norway that they were going to get right. France so quickly. World War I is interesting also because before World War I started, Norway also had the fourth largest merchant marine in the world. And although it was neutral in the war, one half of the Norwegian merchant marine was lost in that war, at least according to what I read from my term paper there yeah. many uh, years ago. Yeah. So um, I think it's kind of uh, interesting, the Norwegian merchant marine being the fourth largest before each world war and losing half of it in the course of each war. Yeah, that, that is interesting. I do want to get our other speakers in. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Vernon. And uh, we want to talk to, I uh, want to have your input in the discussion later. Uh, uh, Phil, uh, Phil Eklund is going to talk about his father's experience uh, and uh, the, as a merchant, Norwegian merchant marine uh, in the uh, Atlantic uh, convoys. Uh, Phil, are you there? Yes. Uh, remember, don't here. forget to unmute yourself. Yes, I think okay. I need to uh, let me stop the sh share so you can do uh, uh, so you can do this share screen. Okay. Okay. Um, good evening. Thanks for the uh, opportunity here. Um, again, it, uh, some people may have stole my thunder a little bit, but about the importance of the Norwegian uh, merchant marine during World War II. Um, I, and some of the facts have already been stated, but um, I just want to give a, like a personal perspective. Um, my father was an 18 year old um, at the time of when uh, Germany invaded Norway and he had no idea what uh, would await his future. So, and uh, he also like many other World War II veterans, he always says, always said to me, I, was, I wasn't a war hero. I didn't, I didn't experience much excitement, but uh, I'd like to uh, dispute that. But anyway, so here is my father as uh, in 1939 for the passport photo. And here's some of his work papers and his pay book um, that he, he kept in his files. So why would someone uh, join uh, the merchant marine from Norway? Well, for young men with a limited education, um, my father felt that his career and his future was almost guaranteed um, because with Norway was still coming out of the Great Depression. Um, it was also not the military. So if you didn't like the ship that you were on, you could sign off. Um, and generally uh, being on a merchant ship was much better than being in the Navy, uh, in which you get higher pay and you had your own cabin uh, or you might share a cabin with someone. So my father had four different jobs throughout his time in the Merchant Marine. He first started off as a uh, mess boy for the officers. Uh, then he was an oiler in the engine room and then he was started to become like a regular uh, sailor. So here's some photos from my uh, father's photo album of some casual moments. You can see that some places they visited uh, were a little bit warmer and more tropical. Um, so you see one on the far right where a sailor is uh, drying his clothes you know, after doing some laundry. Uh, my father here is in the left photo on the left side. I think we're 
with a buddy and they're wearing these World War I era tin hats. Um, so not much protection. So the first ship that my father signed on to was a, a tanker, the Barfon. Again, it's one, one of the modern tankers. It was built in 1931 in Sweden. Um, it had 40 crew members and uh, it usually would go pick up oil in Aruba and then make a circuitous route around South America delivering oil at various ports. Now you might think to yourself, why Aruba? That sounds like a tropical destination. Well, back then Aruba had one of the world's largest oil refineries because oil that was extracted from Venezuela was not processed in Venezuela. It was sent uh, by lake tankers to Aruba, which is only 15 miles off the shore for processing um, because uh, Royal Dutch Shell owned the refinery and, the, and Aruba was a Dutch colony. So on the right, uh, you can see uh, excerpts from the log of various ports that had visited uh, over the years. And you can see a lot of it is, you know, in South American ports. So my father, he left Stavanger in May of 1939 um, and he traveled uh, to La Havre where the ship was docked at the time. And then uh, he was off to Aruba. He felt at home on this ship because many of his uh, crewmates were also from Stavanger. Um, this is where my father first learned how to cook. Um, and he also experienced his first tragedy where uh, an officer uh, fell off the ship and drowned. Uh, he sailed around the Straits of Magellan. Uh, he learned of the German invasion of Poland when he was also in Aruba and he noted that um, there were also a few German ships in the harbor, probably their last oil pickup uh, for the war. But here's a key point. Um, er, people talk about that there was a phony war after the uh, German invasion of Poland and there was nothing going on for a few months, but there was a lot of activity uh, on sea. And there were 58 Norwegian merchant ships were sunk by Axis forces during this time, even before Norway uh, was invaded and it cost the lives of more than 400 seamen. Um, so my father was a uh, witness to history on a few occasions. Um, when they were pulling into Montevideo, they saw the scuttled uh, Admiral Graf Spey, you know, just outside the harbor. Um, and one memory that stuck in his mind was that he was trying to talk to one of the crew members of the Graf Spey in a nightclub and uh, a German officer came over and reprimanded this sailor and uh, took him away. Um, my father was also in Aruba when he learned of the German invasion of Norway and you know, his heart sunk because he knew that um, he wouldn't be able to return home. And this is uh, from, a, you know, again, you have to think of him as a 19 year old, uh, almost a kid. Uh, and he also saw the uh, British battleship MS, HMS Resolution being towed into the harbor in Freetown, Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone was also a British colony. Um, they, uh, the Barfon was delivering oil from Aruba to uh, Freetown at the time. Um, and the resolution was damaged because uh, the Brits and the French uh, failed in their attempt to evict the Vichy French from Sierra Leone, I mean, from Senegal. So after his time on the Barfon, my father signed on to another uh, cargo ship, a Gunderson, that mainly was uh, delivering uh, uh, fruit from the Central America or the Caribbean to the East Coast. Uh, but he didn't stay on the ship too long because he didn't like the accommodations. Um, he woke up uh, almost the morning after he signed on the sh on the sh ship and he wound up full of uh, bites all over him and he found out that his mattress was full of bed bugs so he says I'm getting off. <laughs> so he was free to do that. He then signed on to the Tungsbjörg Furud 
fjord and um this was a ship that went uh all around the world almost it went to ports in asia and africa and this time he was he was serving as an oiler in the engine room he then signed off that uh, when it was in port in the west coast of the US and he signed on to the Marie Baki. Uh, that ship initially was making routes up and down the west coast of both uh, the United States and South America. Until uh, November of 1941, it was ordered to join um, uh, the east coast convoy systems uh, from Halifax. <clears throat> So, and at this time, uh, the, the ship was outfitted with uh, naval guns at a Canadian uh, naval base in Vancouver. And my father had his first introduction to gunnery training. So you see some pictures on the right of uh, types of guns that would be placed on merchant ships. Uh, the one on the top right is one that would be used to target uh, surface U-boats or German raiders. Um, again, many times U-boats would not uh, uh, launch their torpedoes while underwater. They would like to be a surface. Many times they attacked at night um, because the technology for staying underwater for long periods of time was not fully developed at that point in the war. They also installed uh, anti-aircraft guns, which you see a, a representation on the uh, bottom right. So um, you barely had any military training and here they're thrown into um, operating uh, naval guns. Um, he had additional, a little bit more naval training while he was at Governor's Island in New York City, and then more training when he was at Camp Norway in, in Nova Scotia which we'll get to in a minute. So one of the things that uh, really settled on my father's mind was uh, what happened to him on December 7th, 1941. So many of you may remember where you were when Kennedy was shot or when the space shuttle exploded or on 9-11. But he, uh, one thing that impressed on his mind was um, they approached the entrance to the Panama Canal and an American aircraft came by to uh, scope it out. So initially the plane was higher up in altitude for its first pass and then came around for a closer look. And then it looked like it was coming around for a third turn on uh, against the ship. So the officer on deck ordered my father to uh, open fire on the American aircraft if it came uh, back for a third approach. So my father said a few choice words <laughs> to the officer, basically like, heck no, I'm not gonna fire on an American <laughs> aircraft. They had a huge debate and they finally settled on if the aircraft opened fire first, then we would return fire. And so well, what happened, the aircraft came, flew by and toggled its wings like a friendly hello. So once they went through the Panama Canal, they were sailing uh, to New York. And then again, you know, for training at Governor's Island and pick up some more weapons uh, and then up to Halifax. And so while they were sailing by Bermuda, there was another false alarm where the lookout thought that uh, there were two uh, German U-boats coming at them. And then the uh, gunnery officer then uh, and my father looked through the gunnery sites and, and decided, oh, that was a converted passenger liner. So it would have been a big mistake to open fire on a passenger liner. So basically this illustrates that times were very tense and uh, mistakes could have easily been made. So they get to, um, to Halifax. Um, this is a sample of a photo of a convoy forming up. Uh, outside Halifax. Again, remember, um, at this point, the United States had just entered the war. Most of the convoys uh, were uh, launched from the Halifax uh, area. It wouldn't be until a few years later that most of the convoys would originate from the New York City area. So one thing that uh, my father uh, 
uh, again, as deeply embedded in his mind was a time where his ship almost sunk, not because of U-boats uh, or anything, but because of a heavy winter storm. So uh, this is what he wrote down in his, in his mind. Um, uh, for the sake of time, I'll just leave it up here and um, just note that um, all the lifeboats were, were uh, gone or da heavily damaged. Um, and so if the boat went down, um, they, would, they would be floating in the water and then it probably would only be a matter of time before anyone uh, before everyone uh, succumbed to the cold water. So fortunately, the, the ship still stayed afloat and it returned back to Halifax. And uh, initially, they were supposed to go to a closer port of Sydney, Nova Scotia, but uh, they didn't uh, because they heard reports of U-boats uh, in the area. And so um, if you ever go to uboat.net, uh, You'll see that the uh, this is accurate because on January 12th, um, a Canadian airplane attempted to sink a surface uh, U-boat, on, and on January 13th, the same U-boat sunk two um, Allied cargo ships, including a Norwegian ship. So here's uh, some photos uh, again from my father's photo album of, of what the deck of the Marie Baki looked like. Um, a couple of them are, you know, after the storm. So you see all the loose lumber is scattered all over the deck. You see one picture of a, a lifeboat that's not in its position. It's kind of crashed into the side. Uh, and then far one down on the right is actually, I mean, there is no lifeboat. It got lost. And so the the ship makes its uh, way back to Halifax. It goes uh, for repairs for about seven weeks. Uh, during that time, my father gets more gunnery training at Camp Norway. Um, then he sails for another convoy, goes back to England. Uh, it's part of a convoy that in which the uh, minimum speed was uh, 10 knots, but the maximum speed the boat could do is about 10 knots. So it uh, really strained its engine and it had to get parts uh, from Sweden. So my father didn't want to wait around for another, you know, two, three months for the repairs. So he signed on to another ship to get back to um, North America. And, and he wanted to join the uh, Royal Norwegian Navy. He wanted to be a gunner, gunner in charge on merchant ships. Uh, but again, this attacks uh, not just from U-boats, uh, but uh, this time as the ship was leaving Southampton and trying to meet up with a return convoy, it got caught up in a German Luftwaffe raid off the island of Wright. So um, Camp Norway was primarily a, uh, a a base that was set up uh, pretty uh, quickly and uh, it trained uh, nearly 1,000 Norwegians uh, to serve as gunners. Um, and it was in operation until uh, uh, June of 1943 uh, when the mission was transferred to Traverse Island in, in the Bronx, New York City. Uh, because again, most of the convoys by that time uh, were originating from New York. Um, and my father had the opportunity to see the crown prince and crown princess when they boarded his ship uh, in a morale boosting uh, effort. So here's uh, the front entrance to Camp Norway uh, back then and all that's left is in the right photo. Uh, nothing there. <laughs> But they do have some memorabilia in the Fisheries Museum of the Atlantic in Lunenburg. Uh, so some people donated uh, old uniforms and, and pictures and medallions and stuff uh, that you could see there. So some, uh, many uh, Norwegian seamen were injured or sick during the war and overtaxed the hospital system there in uh, Nova Scotia. 
So the Norwegian government bought this uh, hotel and converted it into a rehabilitation center called Kings Hill in Chester. Um, that could support about 153 patients at a time. So a short uh, summary of the fate of the merchants, five merchant ships that my father served on, the three were sunk. Um, two survived the war, but one almost sank due to weather and another one was attacked by the air. So this was all very dangerous occupation. So this gets uh, to some of the uh, statistics that were mentioned before. I, I think it's very important that we um, uh, meditate on this a little bit. Um, there are over 1,100 um, merchant ships that were in international waters that served you know, the Allied cause during World War II. Um, numbers are, can fluctuate because there were some ships like whaling ships <laughs> that were converted to uh, do cargo. So it depends what your denominator is, but basically there were 570 Norwegian ships that were either torpedoed, sunk or captured. So that was slightly more than half of the pre-war fleet. Um, again, nearly 4,000 Norwegian uh, civilians um, serving at sea, including 70 women, lost their lives uh, as a result of World War II. Uh, and there were about 6,000 sick or wounded seamen, including my father. So if you compare the casualty rates of other branches of the service and you see the Norwegian merchant sailors, you'll see that the immense uh, sacrifice that they made. So if you were in a time, time machine in 1945 and you had a choice between, oh, should I serve in the Marine Corps or should I be a Norwegian merchant seaman? You probably would survive better if you joined the Marine Corps. So uh, this is my father when he uh, finally got his uh, war medal. Um, it took a long time, but they finally recognized merchant seamen for their service. In, uh, and he, in 1979, so he got his medal in, in 1981. And just want to say thank you for uh, uh, listening. And, and this center picture is uh, a monument, a memorial to all the Norwegian merchant seamen and Navy persons who uh, served during World War II in, in Oslo Harbor. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Phil. Um, uh, thank you for the very good presentation. And uh, I want to also, uh, we'll hold questions on this because John's talk is going to be pretty similar and then we'll open to questions for everybody, okay? John, are you ready to speak? Yeah, I think we got to do the... Uh... Now, Phil, can you... Uh, um, yeah, okay, good. Share screen. Hang on a minute, folks. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, that's my dad and my daughter, Emily, who is a member of the lodge in, in uh, Washington, DC. I don't know if Emily's on tonight, but uh, it's right about bedtime for her children right now. But that's my dad and they're in our old sailboat. And uh, my father has a sort of remarkable, almost very impossible story to tell his, his wartime experiences as an officer where uh, the kind of challenges and, and uh, experiences that few people can go through. But he was a strong believer in, in uh, morale and, uh, and sort of inner strength and, and the power of that. Um, he'd been trained as an officer in a very, very rigorous um, uh, discipline. I mean, the Norwegian Birch Marine for its size is extremely uh, modern. Uh, and uh, there were decades of, of tradition in, in, in developing. He starts at the sea as a, as a cabin boy, uh, like Phil's dad. And um, what's interesting is the ships he was on, the crew ate separately. 
the officers and the passengers ate together. So hence, as a cabin boy, he would be um, uh, around role models if he wanted to be a future officer. So I'm going to begin with the end of the mine because this, this has this story has a, a happy ending. Um, he lived a life that was just extremely challenging to, to just to tell. Uh, he went to sea very young, sending money home for the family. And most of the Norwegian Merchant Marine was like that. They were basically a way to support people ashore. Um, and uh, I, don't think, uh, I don't think there was a family in Norway didn't have somebody at sea. Um, and as an officer, he would experience three violent sinkings uh, and many other close calls. Uh, during the war, he slept when he could. And, I, and this is a 24 seven job uh, when you're a, an officer on a ship. Um, with his personal papers kept in a watertight pouch wrapped around his waist. Uh, later in life, a lot of this would catch up with him, uh, and especially late in the 60s, nightmares and that type of thing. Um, and it would take a toll on his health. Um, but later, fighting for himself and other veterans and their families, it would be proved to be a, a wonderful healing medicine for him. So we're going to cover a little bit today. In talking to Bill earlier, uh, some of the sinkings and, and, and actions and stuff we'll probably try to cover in part two of this. That's uh, my dad uh, in the middle there and my mom on, on the left. My mother had been the secretary to the captain of the port for Nortra ship. Now Nortra ship was an immense consortium of um, Norwegian shipping companies with close to, I think the numbers are around 1,000 to 1,100 ships under, under charter. Um, and my dad would, at one point uh, during the war, work in the office. Um, and that's kind of how they got together. Uh, the lady on the far right is Mrs. Hestog. Her husband was the um, Norwegian consulate in, in uh, New York during the war. And he was a very helpful man to the, to the sailors. And uh, uh, the Creek Sailors, the Norwegian War Sailors Club, would always have her present for any big event. Uh, she was a favorite. Uh, on the far left, and I don't know his name, is, is a pastor from the Norwegian Siemens Church. And as Phil mentioned earlier, um, the Siemens Church was uh, very important in the life of, of the sailors and the families. I mean, a lot of us had children christened in the, in the Siemens Church in New York. Uh, a, lot, a lot of folks married there. Um, but it was also the base uh, for this massive Norwegian merchant fleet. At any given time, there were thousands of sailors at, out. And so they needed a base and a home. Uh, and the church served that way. And I think it's a story that really hasn't been told very much about the good work they've done. Um, I'm going to go through some of the wartime ships. Um, the Hosanger was the first ship my father was on as a young officer. He had to leave the ship, uh, go ashore, uh, to draw a number from a big barrel, which was a, a naval lottery, to see if he was going to serve in the Navy. Um, while he, he tried to get back to the ship, but he missed it. It went out, and this is during that phony war period. The ship was torpedoed, and there's only one survivor on the Hosanger. Uh, actually, three get into a lifeboat, but two of them freeze to death. Um, well, this had been like the first ship my father had been an officer on, and, and they had been very good to him and, and, and very close. So he, he suffered from the, the loss of his friends. The next ship was the Taranger, and um, he had taken a certificate as a mate and a certificate as a radio operator. And this was done because the uh, ships were required to carry a radio operator. Um, and uh, this was still toward the end of the depression and uh, you had trouble getting positions. So if they hired a mate with a radio operator's license, they could save one salary. So it was almost a guaranteed way to get uh, employment. So anyways, uh, the, the, the towering is involved in a lot of interesting um, uh, evacuation of, of some of the Norwegian diplomats from France. Um, uh, there's some stuff we'll go into maybe part two here. Uh, it's actually briefly interred in Casablanca by the French, uh, and, but they, they get out of that uh, by bribing some people ashore. <laughs> and uh, uh, the one thing about the Norwegian ships, they, they knew how to, to manage things in the world. Um, uh, the ship is in Liverpool during one of the big 14-day blitzes. She's actually in dry dock. So my father said the whole ship was shaking every night while the bombs were dropping. She leaves Liverpool and is, is, is chased by a submarine for almost a day and then strafed and shelled and torpedoed. Um, 
uh, the survivors are picked up by the Corps. And there's quite a story, which I think we'll, we'll share for part two here. But um, uh, they barely escaped. Uh, my father was the radio operator. He got off the message, which I guess made the, uh, the submarine even more angry. But uh, this, this, this Norwegian ship had weapons, so they actually fired back at the submarine. Um, but my father was commanding the uh, starboard lifeboat, which was the lifeboat on the side of the sub. And um, he was told to launch the boat and wait for the captain and the chief engineer. Uh, while he was waiting, and there were a lot of wounded in the boat, um, the chief engineer actually dove off the deck into the water and they picked him up because he'd been badly wounded and couldn't hang, hold on to the ladder. Um, so my father said, where's the captain? And he said, well, when the shell hit, the captain's head had been blown off. So he wasn't coming. So, I mean, you talk about some pretty serious actions here. And there's a lot more detail I could go into on this. Uh, then he took a job on a Norwegian coastal vessel that was traveling the British coast uh, from Scotland down to Liverpool. But uh, this was like the height of the sort of air attacks. And uh, he decided it was time to maybe leave and find a, a safer ship. So he signed on to the Blink. Now the Blink, he was the chief, he was the chief mate on the Blink. Uh, and this would be one of Norway's worst maritime disasters. The Blink would be uh, torpedoed off of Cape Hatteras uh, in February, 1942 at 2 p.m. Um, and, uh, no, I'm sorry, 2, 2 a.m. I got that wrong there, it's 2 a.m. And um, it's during a gale. And of course, it's a real challenge to get the lifeboat launched. The main lifeboat had been destroyed. Um, and so 23 folks get into the, into the lifeboat. Um, they're in a, a very bad situation with the storm. And over the next, they, they roll the boat over trying to make sail. Uh, they lose their uh, fresh water, they lose their food. And um, over the next three days, 16 would, would die in the open lifeboat. Um, from that, he went to the Oregon Express, which was an interesting ship in that it was a, a refrigeration ship carrying meat uh, to, to Britain. Uh, and it also carried passengers. It was a, capable, a ship that was capable of 19 knots. So for most of the war, it ran by itself. Um, and it would eventually uh, get torpedoed in a, in, a, in a convoy in the middle of the Atlantic. Um, my father would be pretty badly wounded there and end up in a hospital in Iceland. Um, they brought him back to New York and they scheduled some special surgery on his back after, this, uh, after the Oregon Express was sunk. Um, but they asked him to take an assignment while he was waiting for his surgery to be scheduled uh, and be the mate on the Polar Land. So he took a job on the Polar Land as, as, uh, as the mate, when he, because the mate on the ship wanted to get married. And um, when my father came back for his surgery, the, the mate took his place. The Polar Land was torpedoed and everybody was lost. So he had a number of close calls, all right? And then one of the last assignments he had was a navigator uh, on a ship they brought in off the coast of Normandy and they actually scuttled it. And uh, as a navigator, he had to come up with the, the positioning of this whole thing, which I guess was quite an enterprise because they, and it was kind of a little bit for Norwegians, maybe a little bit uh, uh, outside the norm sinking a ship. So what I want to talk about is, is the Oregon Express and um, this is um, a, a poster from a nightclub in New York, Leon and Eddie's, which was a pretty famous nightclub. Um, it originally been a speakeasy in New York. Um, and the owners were uh, a couple of real hustlers who, who managed to get hold of a big property just as uh, prohibition was ended. So they, they got this, this nightclub run, and it was a, a pretty hot spot. I mean, uh, 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 Martin and Lewis had a lot of comics, uh, and it was a pretty famous spot. The owners also had a place in London and they went back and forth regularly on the Oregon Express. And um, so there was a deal for the officers on the Oregon Express. If they came to Leon and Eddie's, they got a special table and they got their first round of drinks free. <laughs> so my father actually took my mother there on his first date. <laughs> so with Leon and Eddie's, it was kind of a, a special place for us and our family. Uh, uh, and it's, it, if you look on a, anything about old New York, it's, it's, it's a real hot spot. Um, and for all accounts, the, 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 the owners were very interesting people to travel. And, uh, and the Norwegian ships were actually noted for um, uh, the care and, and cuisine and that type of thing. So uh, 
Uh, that's something that we don't talk too much about, but uh, these ships all had uh, sort of niches and passengers was one of them. All right, the blink, I, I'm going back to that is, is, is 2 a.m. It's, it, it's, it's, and again, it's right off of Cape Hatteras. Uh, if you look at a map of the uh, east coast of, of wrecked ships, it's right there, right off Cape Hatteras. Um, the main lifeboat is destroyed in the blast. Uh, they take the smaller lifeboat with the 23 men. As they're leaving the ship, they see two men on the, on the deck of the ship as it's sinking, waving. And they yell to them um, to launch the life raft to pick them up in the morning. Now, the cabin boy, actually, five years ago, I got an email from his nephew. Uh, and the family was still wanting to know a closure, what had happened to me. I think he was all of 15 years old when this happened. And he was from Nova Scotia. Um, the morning reveals no raft, but a horrible sea conditions. And uh, the lifeboat overturned several times. The men finally sit in it, this near flooded boat, unable to get water um, and enter the food. Um, and next day they begin to perish one per hour. Uh, and after, six, after three days, only six survive. So my father took the time to write, he was the only officer that survived and he took the, took the time to write the log, the final log of the blink. And after the war, this became a major go-to document for historians. Um, and then there were a couple of interviews over the years with the, uh, the Norwegian broadcasting system. And one of the things he, he speaks about an awful lot while these guys are in the lifeboats, um, when a man lost hope, within an hour, he'd be dead. So unless you're in a situation like that, you don't know the real power of hope because that's the only thing you've got going for you. All right. And, he felt real bad because in, in many ways the officers were supposed to keep up morale and he tried his best, but you know, it was a, a, a terrible situation. Um, the captain spoke of home and then he dies. Now these are the survivors from the, four of the survivors from the blink, two are still in hospital here. Uh, that's my dad's picture from his passport, which was in the water three, that had been in the sea three times. Um, and a picture of the blink on the bottom there, I don't know if you can see it, um, but, What's interesting here is those are all brand new suits that they've either been that, that they've been they've been given because they, they didn't have any clothes left. Uh, the rescue ship that picked them up um, uh, was the the Glendanian out of Baltimore, and as soon as they got on, my father was the only officer. The, the, the captain took him down to his cabin and had my father sign papers, uh, and then he opened up the ship's store on there and and issued them new clothing. So, I mean, the Merchant Marine was a difficult profession, you know, and, and here they were uh, after three days in a lifeboat uh, buying things, right? Um, when my father passed away in, in 1996, there was a woman at the funeral who came to me and her father had owned a tailor shop in Brooklyn. And she said she had gotten to know my father because he was coming in there frequently to get new uniforms. So three times he sunk, three times he loses all of his, his gear. And... Uh, so his log is still quoted today. Right now, I took this off of the Norwegian Broadcasting website. It's still up. Um, and it's a nice video that goes with it, uh, but it, for, it's mostly in Norwegian. And um, they're, they're, uh, they filmed this in Brooklyn. Now, I think we should point out that in 1940, the census points out there were 55,000 Norwegians living in Brooklyn. And that's a pretty healthy number for a country the size of Norway. And during the war, that number grew more. And that doesn't count the rest of the metropolitan area either. Now, my father's health began to fail in the late 60s. He'd gone on to become a captain on, on American ships um, and everything and, and, and had a career there. Uh, owned a business on Staten Island for many years, a dock. And then um, he visited Norway in the 60s and the doctor had told him he had what they called war stress illness. Um, but the pension system was aimed at the underground and military, not the merchant marine. So a few years later, he suffered a major heart attack and he was hospitalized for six weeks, three weeks intensive care, three weeks regular hospital. And nobody thought he'd make it, but he did. Um, during recovery, and he took about a year off, he really seriously studied the Norwegian pension law and he applied, all right? Uh, the pension was denied and he appealed it again. It was denied again. And he appealed finally to the final court um, and after a lengthy wait, wait, he was awarded the pension. So I, in many ways, his wartime experience were well known in Norway. So he was like a, a classic test case for this. And I think uh, paved the way for what would then become uh, uh, access to the Merchant Marine, 
for these types of uh, benefits. Um, he became such an expert in the pension system that people would fly into, into New York to visit him. And he kept a really extensive uh, library on the shipping because a lot of these guys, when their ships went down, they lost all their papers. Um, but one thing I think that drove my father to, to strive for this was the Norwegian shipping, which of these thousand ships had generated an incredible wartime revenues. I mean, people are paying premiums to get these cargoes into these war zones, all right? Um, this money was used to pay for the government exile and, and a, a large fund was created for reconstruction in Norway after the war, but the sailors didn't get any of this. And there's also some aspects, their pay was actually reduced during the war um, and they were supposed to get that at the end. Um, but in the six, late 60s and 70s, they began to organize. Um, and slowly they started to get uh, um, together. That's uh, uh, my father would one of the guys from the, the Norwegian uh, Navy so the two, two veterans organizations came together. Um, they had a, their own little paper and they began to get some, some recognition. Like my father was being invited more and more to diplomatic things in New York. That's a, a picture at the bottom there with the, the prime minister, Ro Brunlin. And um, they had a, a sort of a, a resurgence, if you would, a slow appreciation came about the sailors. All right. Um, they would always have a float in the parade in Brooklyn. Now, Brooklyn in the 80s still had a two hour long 17th of May parade. Uh, and everybody liked to have a Viking ship, but uh, the war sailors felt best in a lifeboat. I mean, they really didn't think themselves uh, <laughs> as Vikings. Um, this is something that fill, uh, a picture uh, of uh, the king being here. There's a rock in Battery Park, Manhattan, a memorial rock that Phil and I both try to keep uh, the, the city of New York taking care of. It gets moved every once in a while, so they'll have a rededication at times. This is one of the, I don't know which dedication this was, but, uh, but it was uh, uh, in the 90s. Um, the, the British um, historians, and historians take a long time to sort of come to grips with things, but by the 90s, they started to write more and more about uh, the, the Norwegian contribution in the war. All right, the, the critical aspects with the fuel and things like that. So they did a documentary called Forgotten Heroes. And my father's featured in that. It's a good film, it's about an hour long. He speaks about, oh, uh, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes maybe. Um, and uh, they have him interviewed in Norwegian, which is kind of interesting because uh, his accent is rather old. <laughs> and, and so the modern Norwegians are, will, will, will be looking at the English subtitles, I think. But uh, this is a, um, this is the uh, uh, London Times TV section. And, uh, uh, and they featured his picture, which I thought was really nice. Uh, when he died, he got a, a very uh, good, uh, a large write-up in the, in the Times of London obituary. The New York Times as well uh, did a, um, a, a, a lengthy obituary. And I, at the time, talking to some of his friends from the, the war sailors and stuff, particularly the the Times of London article, which features the significance of the singular contribution of the Norwegians. It was the first time for a lot of them that they, that certainly any of the sailors had gotten mentioned in, in, in a major paper. So um, um, it, it ended, I would say, uh, you know, uh, uh, in a very positive note. And, and, but helping all the other people that he did, and it was close to 600 cases that he would uh, put together, and some of them were extremely complicated. I helped him toward the end of his life with a lot of these things. And um, uh, one of the last cases was a, a woman, a widow down in Florida. Uh, she had lived with the sailor for a while and, uh, and then they had gotten married and she had quit her job to take care of him uh, for, for a couple of years. And then when he died, she thought she'd, be, she'd get the widow's pension and they denied it to her. So my father was one of these uh, sort of tenacious type uh, particularly as Norwegian captains were taught to not take no for an answer. So he, he had her pull the tax records from the county that showed them two jointly paying into the property for 15 years. And we put that in some documents and, and a lengthy letter. And just before he died, uh, she called up and she had gotten her pension and a and two years back pay. So, I mean, it was a, a really special moment. Uh, but, uh, but again, a, a sort of complicated situation. So I think, I think that's where I probably ended. I think when we do part two, there's a lot more things we could talk about and, and these incidents, but maybe this is where a good place to end it, Bill. 
Yeah, I think so. Uh, very good talk with John. Very good talk, Phil. And of course, Jordan, very good talk. Uh, very interesting. A lot of human details that we don't often get in history books. Uh, one thing that I just mentioned is that I think the Norwegian tankers, um, German captains would target uh, would target larger, larger ships because the idea was to sink as much tonnage. And the typical U-boat would be a class seven that would only have 14 torpedoes. So they're not going to waste them on uh, small ships. They want to go after the tankers. And since uh, Norway had a lot of the tankers and large ships, uh, Norwegian seamen would be more likely in the crosshairs than other ships. So that probably is why uh, both you and uh, uh, Phil's father were in the water so many times because they were on these uh, prime targets. His dad and my father always contended that the, the Norwegian ships were put in the outer columns of the convoy. Ah. Well, now, one of the arguments there was they were much more professional merchantmen and much more likely to hold station properly. Yeah. But my father thought maybe there were other reasons. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So they would put the, the as, as everyone knows, the, the inner, you want to be in the inner columns of the uh, convoy. Um, yeah, so yes, that might have been their professionalism or they might, or the British who are running the uh, convoys might want to protect their own ships. So, yeah. Um, and, uh, but one thing is that when a ship was hit, the other sh merchant ships were strictly forbidden to help it because they wanted to keep the um, formation. They weren't to break formation. And also if the ship stopped to help, they would become a target of the U-boat. So when the, the uh, wolf pack would attack, the merchant uh, ships were instructed to sc scatter as far away as they can and not to help anyone. So if you're in a lifeboat, you're pretty much on your own until maybe the uh, escort would uh, be able to help you. Yeah, one of the situations, and, and this is the, the Oregon Express, when it's torpedoed, it's in the middle of the Atlantic in this area where they couldn't get the air protection. Mm -hmm. And the first night they entered that zone, one of the rescue ships was torpedoed and sunk. Mm -hmm. So the night the Oregon Express got it, they, they tried a new type of acoustic torpedo and so the ships, the ships in front of it were hit in the stern with the, the noise from the engine was coming. Mm. And then the Oregon Express got it. Um, mm. And it was total chaos. But uh, and, and growing up in my family, uh, the Danish people could do no wrong because the Danish ship stopped in the middle of all this and picked up uh, the crew of the, the survivors from the Oregon Express and the other three ships. Mm -hmm. So it was like, uh, they, he, this guy took the ultimate risk. Um, yeah, that, that would be very courageous, yes. Because uh, they were instructed not to do that. Okay, yeah. I, um, I want to know if, um, uh, okay, Eric, did you have a comment? No, that's right about the, the acoustic torpedoes lasted for a little while, but then they caught on what was going on and they dragged essentially rods that would bang together and sort of fool the torpedoes. Okay, uh, John, uh, if you're finished with the slides, can you uh, um... stop share? Let's see, I can, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Can you cut me out? Or, uh, let's see. All right. Let's see. You should be able to. Uh, no, I didn't. I... <coughs> All right. Okay. Good. So well, we're back. Uh, so, um, as I mentioned, I, I instructed the speakers to say some good stuff for the next meeting. So I hope uh, everyone can participate, but I'd like to have a, a discussion now uh, on the questions. Uh, um, uh, Vernon, I didn't want to cut you off before. Do you have any comments? Uh, at, at the moment, none. I thought they were fabulous product, uh, presentations. Well done, guys. 
Mm -hmm. and, and it's really a, such a fascinating subject. There's so so much uh, written about it, and uh, uh, so and uh, such a human drama. Um, uh, Irene, you had a comment. Have to unmute. Irene, you have to unmute. Okay, I thought it was a wonderful presentation and and uh, all three and I, I read about the difficulties with getting pensions for the the merchant marine and I, I was so pleased to hear all the achievements your father had made in that regard. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, now that we're older, I think we all appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> what, yes. What that can mean, yeah. I, I should have added that the the, the club, the, 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 the and Phil's father played a role in this club too at one time. I think he was the final president of it. Um, the the height, they had almost 600 members in, in the metropolitan area. And then they opened up chapters in uh, New Orleans and uh, Seattle and Chicago. Um, mm -hmm. And there were lady war sailors too. There were many of the radio operators were women on the ships. So there was at least three women who had gone through this uh, as radio operators. Uh -huh. and one of the women radio operators was married to a, a guy named Willie Berg, who he had been torpedoed in the first world war. Oh. Sunk again in the second world war, was a carpenter on American ships and was hit by a sniper in Saigon while he was walking on the deck of the cargo ship. Uh, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> and he survived it all. I mean, uh, and uh, in his youth, he had been a boxer at the Olympics. He was a kind of a, a petite guy, uh, you know, but, but physically you know, really developed. And uh, for a while he was a protege of uh, Mae West. He traveled with her. <laughs> oh my goodness. Now, that yeah, sounds like a, a novel. Yeah, it does. It does. It does. I mean, it, the, the the parties they used to have in the in the seventies there in Brooklyn, uh, 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 they'd always have a, a great band. They had Walter Erickson, who, who was a a really great accordionist in his band, and there'd always be a party, and there'd always be some local. Uh, um, in fact, I, I thought I had a picture of uh, Lee Olman. I'll have to dig it out for the next talk. She she actually came to the seven the seventies of May parades were were big events, and. Uh, and uh, they'd always get a lot of uh, local Norwegian celebrities who were in the area and stuff. Uh, the sailors really knew how to throw a good party. Mm -hmm. um, but I think um, I was, uh, mentioned that, that Churchill made the comment that the thing that he was most worried about in the war was the Atlantic campaign. He said he was more worried about that than even the Battle of Britain, because uh, that is something that the Germans, had they won, that would have changed, had the Germans won the Battle of the Atlantic, that would have changed the whole complexion of the war entirely. Not it, just simply the uh, Eastern theater, but also the Western theaters. Well, in 1943, they come close to sort of shutting things down. The, the U-boats, uh, there's so many of them, and they perfect that wolf pack. Uh, yeah. You know, that. Uh, um, and they crack at one point, they crack the code, the allied codes. So uh, yeah. they know where the, where the convoys are going. Yeah, it's- you know, I, I, I have a comment, if I may. Yeah. It's Marianne Voigt, I'm in Florida here, but formerly of McLean and, and I'm an Olson, but um, Phil Esquilin, you, you all did a great job, but I know Phil and I knew his dad and his dad was so deaf. And I think people underestimate the damage that all this explosions and machine guns had on the poor sailors that their sacrifice went on for decades because they lost their hearing. Yeah. 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 That, that's true. I, they didn't have all the, you know, the ear plugs and stuff that you see uh, today. I mean, this is a common problem through mm -hmm. and anyone who served in like world war two, uh, you know, around yeah. <laughs> large exploding things. Yes. That's not good for your ears. Yeah, but I also wanted to uh, uh, raise uh, the point of um, um, there was the Germans had something called Operation Drumbeat. So uh, this came uh, right after Germany declared war on the United States, um, which people may find, you know, where did that come from in, in one sense? But 
I think um, Hitler had in his mind to starve, uh, you know, uh, Britain and all at any resupply. So he thought he'd try to catch the United States kind of with its with its pants down, being uh, unprepared. And so this is where uh, they started to deploy um, all the longer range U-boats, newer U-boats, made all the way to the East Coast and um, just started lighting up all these, uh, all these ships um, that were just sailing uh, like on, on their own. Some of them were sailing to join the convoys up in Halifax. They would pick up oil in Texas and go around Florida and then come up the coast and they would be sailing all by themselves. And then you had the silhouettes of the Atlantic uh, seaboard, you know, cities lit up, you know, whether it's, you know, off Delaware or Atlantic City or New York. Uh, I mean, the first uh, two um, casualties of Operation Drumbeat were off, you know, the coast of Long Island. Mm -hmm. And so we lost, I think, about uh, 600 ships during Operation Drumbeat, which was from about January of 1942 to June of 1942. Um, I think about 5,000 uh, seamen were lost of all nationalities. The Germans only lost 22 U-boats in that time. Mm -hmm. yeah. The Norwegian government used to have a memorial down in North Carolina service because there were so many Norwegian ships, particularly tankers off uh, the Carolinas and Cape Hatteras that were uh, sunk during that period that they, the Germans called a happy time. But uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And particularly Cape Hatteras because that's only the, uh, uh, coastal high, uh, the coastal waterway is like 30 miles wide, which is not, uh, which is sort of a perfect target uh, area for the German U-boats. Mm -hmm. It's it's also true that uh, it was a bit self-made, unfortunately, because the U.S. Navy didn't want to do convoys. They mm -hmm. thought they could do better without. And um, so, of course, people said Admiral King, who was fairly anti-British. Yes, I wouldn't yes. take anything that the uh, Brits did, but of course, after a while, he was pretty much forced to it because, as, well, as you mentioned, Phil, the losses were so high. Yeah, yeah, in, in I, these I, coastal waters around the U.S. The East Coast. Yeah, Admiral King could be very uh, strong-willed individual, and he did not like the British. <laughs> could it just say that it was the convoy system that proved to be decisive in both world wars? Both World War I and World War II, it was con the convoy system that really did it. And in the Second World War, the climax to the whole Battle of the Atlantic came in early 43. And it was at that point that the Allies broke the back then of the resistance U boat and made possible D Day. D Day would have been impossible without the shipping being secure across the Atlantic. So first they secured the sea in early 1943. And then in early 44, they, they completed the uh, command of the air over Europe. And with command of the sea and command of the air, then the D-Day invasion could go forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's very oh, true. And I was going to say also just quickly that the decisive weapon in the Battle of the Atlantic, what won it for the Allies was um, the aircraft carriers, the small escort carriers, they were able to put over the convoy so that the convoys had continuous air cover from port to port, completely across the Atlantic. And this continuous air cover proved decisive against the U-boats because, well, it just proved decisive. And, um, and that was some of the, you know, Air, air, uh, air forces were based in Iceland, but it was the de escort carriers, say, carrying about 40 planes is all that did it. That's all I have. Yeah, the, that's very true. The U-boats uh, were very vulnerable uh, to uh, aircraft because they had to spend most of their time on the surface. And also because Germany had them in constant radio contact with uh with the uh the um uh, submarine command which actually was in france but they they were in constant radio ca contact which also meant the uh they're easy to locate plus uh i think one interesting both the british 
and the Germans were able to break each other's code. But neither of them would believe that the other side could break their code. Uh, so they both knew they could break the other code, but no, the other side, they're too dumb to break our code. The um, Americans were able to persuade the British uh, that their code was broken. It took a good year and the British did change their code once they accepted the fact that it was broken. But the Germans were shocked at the end of the war to learn that their codes had been broken. And if you want to um, maybe capture a small glimpse of, um, of the Battle of the Atlantic and, and the terror and um, that the seamen experienced, um, I would encourage people to see the, uh, the Tom Hanks movie, Greyhound. Uh, it just gives, which I think is on Apple TV, which just gives a little taste of what, what was a normal convoy uh, System like so when when you talk about um, the the most tense times was when they were outside of air cover. Mm -hmm. So that was called the hole, wasn't it? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah well, it wasn't just the uh, the escort carriers. It was also they s s diverted B twenty fours from the Air Force and gave them to the Navy, and the B twenty four had much more range than anything else they had used. Uh, so flying from the US or Canada or from Britain, the B-24s could cover pretty much the, the entire North Atlantic. And it could definitely cover the Bay of Biscay, which was what the most German submarines had to transit in order to get to the operating areas. So they were, uh, it was a vulnerable time. And with the codes, having been broken, frequently the planes knew right where to go to find a U-boat. So it was, it was a very complicated mm -hmm. situation, lots of moving parts. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of moving parts in that uh, war. And uh, yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the, I think they built like 14,000 uh, B-24s. Uh, and that was produced by uh, the Ford company, particularly Edsel Ford. That uh, the Ford, more B-24s were produced than any other military aircraft in history. And I think pretty much that's going to stay a record unless something really changes. So uh, Ford was making those things one an hour. They're just mat uh, mass producing this incredible effort, as was the American industrial uh, uh, produ uh, production. I mean, for example, the Liber there was over 2,700 Liberty ships produced, which is an incredible number. Mm -hmm. It's it's very true, but I think we also have to remember, which is often forgotten, is that it took some time before the U.S. production got there. Yeah. So in 1942, for example, which may have been the most critical year of the war. U.S. contribution, I'm talking about Europe now, not Japan, mm -hmm. uh, against Japan, the U.S. contribution was still, if not minor, but not as overwhelming as it would be in 1944. Yeah. It wasn't until 1944, actually, that the U.S. Army exceeded the British Army in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. It was after, after D-Day, even on D-Day, the British had more soldiers in the field. Mm -hmm. so. But they were using American weapons, but yes. Well, only to a certain extent. Uh, uh, you mentioned, for example, uh, the, the B-24, which was the most produced bomber, but uh, the most produced Allied airplane was the Spitfire, which was produced in a bigger number than any any other okay. Allied okay. plane. Yeah. So it's, yes, Britain was, uh, especially as time went by, became very dependent on the US. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, it was still... It took some time before it was really 44, late 44 and 45, where the US uh, became overwhelming. And you see it in the production, how it just sort of yeah. goes, you know, and then suddenly it almost like shoots up in, in 44. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also the North Atlantic convoy operations were very heavily a British and Canadian. The, the, the role of the Canadian Navy uh, was very important. And then the Norwegian Navy and the Polish Navy and 
many of the other smaller allies made contributions, but they mostly worked with the British. And that uh, the US Navy was more in the Central Atlantic and the South Atlantic. So the, you can't underestimate the, the work the Brits and their allies did up in the North Atlantic, which was to some extent a critical area. But I just have make a quick question of Mr. Flood. Uh, can you tell us about the Norwegian Merchant Marine today? Um, if it's still as big as it, as it has been in the past? And uh, is, go no, ahead. No, at least relatively, it's not, not anywhere near. And of course, uh, it, it's still substantial, but not nothing like what it used to be. And um, I think it partly had what happened also when uh, the oil age hit Norway in the 70s, late 70s, really. The first oil didn't come in until 73, I think. Uh, in the 70s and 80s, you know, a lot of the ship owners switched from being building big uh, freighters to building all these specialty ships that you needed in the, uh, in the North Sea and, uh, well, other areas too, but of course, primarily in the North Sea. So the, yeah, the, I don't know the, the exact the size, but it's nowhere, nothing like it, what it used to be. The one uh, maritime thing, which is still bigger, is uh, fishing. The fishing industry, the fishing boats, of course, where you had the 20 old fishing boats you made, they have one trawler. But um, just a couple of years ago, uh, when, uh, when the oil dropped a little bit, for example, the income from the Norwegian fish export was bigger than the oil export. So the, the, uh, again, you know, the idea that Norway only lives in oil is, is, uh, is, is, not, is simply not correct. And also because, yeah, it's an important export, obviously, and import, very, it became very important. Uh, it took the place among other shipping, but uh, like the, uh, the second largest uh, export income is still from fishing. Little divergence there, but uh. <laughs> well, you got the farm raised stuff too, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the Norway is Norway is uh, difference between Sweden and Norway, apart from Sweden being twice the size, you know, in population, so on. Is that when you go to out and buy something, um, you know, when you buy Swedish things, you know, you know Volvo, you know. Uh, Saab, well, Saab, unfortunately, doesn't exist in my LMX and so on. I worked for Hydro Aluminum, which is a Norwegian company, one of the largest, and uh, uh, in California, and sorry, in um, Florida, when we lived there and when we lived in Michigan. And uh, Hydro Aluminum is, is one of the major suppliers to the auto industry. So, for most of you, have GM and Ford cars and so on. A lot of you will have a lot of Norwegian parts because Norwegian aluminum industry is very. But uh, most people, including myself, I don't really know who made it is in my Ford, but it may very well have been, uh, been from uh, Hydroluminum because they were big suppliers to uh, those kind of parts. But, it's, but people don't think about it because you don't see, you know, except for Freya chocolate. <laughs> which, um, <laughs> this is my main reason to go to New York and the Norwegian Siemens Church there. Um, Apart from that, you know, you don't really know what, when you buy a Norwegian and like I'll, a I'll give you, a little, I, you know, I, I worked for a chocolate company for many years, Mars, right? And uh, Mr. Mars and Mr. Freya were pals. So if you're in England, the uh, Mars Galaxy Bar is the Freya formula. Oh, oh he, okay. He gave that to, to Mr. Mars and then Mr. Mars in turn gave him the rights to do the, the M&Ms <laughs> Norway. So if you pick up, uh, but what's interesting is Kraft bought Freya, and that's an American company. And they, they tried to take that uh, copyright uh, aspect for the, the, the peanut M&M in particular around the world. And they said, no, and so the Mars company said, no, that's something that, that was between Mr. Mars and Mr. Freya. <laughs> and it's okay. strictly a Norwegian thing. But if you buy the, uh, the Icelandic milk chocolate, it'll taste very similar to the Freya. So if you're really hard up, go look for Icelandic chocolate. That's pretty good milk. Well, you also have Marabou because Marabou is owned by Freya. That's the Swedish chocolate. And okay. here in Pennsylvania, in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia area, um, they sell it at the Swedish uh, American Historical Museum. Yeah. 
That's uh, why I became a board member there because they sell the shop with. <laughs> uh, Keith Waters uh, would like to say some words about the uh, Norwegian uh, Children's Home in Brooklyn. Uh, I think that's an interesting topic. Keith, uh, you want to say something? You have to unmute yourself first. Uh, Keith, are you there? Just unmute yourself. Would like to hear some from you. Okay. Maybe he doesn't know to click the little red symbol in the. You have to click the little red symbol. Ah. Okay, well, Keith, if you, anytime you want to chime in, please do so. Um, okay, uh, any other um, uh, topics or anything you want to contribute? It's interesting about the Mars bar. I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, because I well, I enjoyed that in, in England when I enjoyed that um, Galaxy uh, bar, yeah. and yeah. I didn't realize it was a Norwegian recipe. It's quite good. Well, it has to do with the way that milk is is treated. That's it's all the, the the secrets of these things, you know. So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, your dark chocolate is another story altogether. So, is it still from Norwegian cows? I hope. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a good question. Um, Probably the Norwegian, the globally dairy is still a very much protected industry. I mean, so that the U.S. most of the chocolate here would be made with American milk. Maybe a couple times a year, uh, if the market's right, the government will allow you to import uh, typically New Zealand, which is the two low producers of milk in the world in New Zealand and Ireland. They both have the biggest uh, uh, grassy fields. So, uh, so. <laughs> You can once in a while import New Zealand milk into the U.S., but uh, for the most part, it's it's domestic in almost every country of the world. So I would think, yeah, I think it's it's probably Norwegian milk, Norwegian. I, I've heard that Norway has very um, protective laws for their dairy um, resources. You know, the cows have to have mattresses to lie on. And things. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why their chocolate and cheese is so good. Question: This is Keith Waters. Could you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, uh -oh. I hear you. Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. I'm going to try not to talk too much, yeah, but I'm so impressed by the, um, the heroic contributions that uh, people's parents have made um, to the, um, the war effort and to, the, and to humanity. But I, I came to the Norwegian Children's Home in the 60s and was immersed in Norwegian culture. Um, the Norwegian Children's Home was set up in 1909. Many of the sailors were lost at sea and we didn't have a welfare system then. So women would have to work and there was no one to care for children. So at, at times they'd have up to a hundred children in a, in a magnificent building that was built through donations from the Norwegians community. Um, every year we'd have events uh, of 17th of May, we'd have a float in the parade, we'd have an open house. Uh, the king came to the home while I was there on more than one occasion. Council General would come. And um, the children were really immersed in Norwegian culture from the food. The people who worked there usually came from Norway. Um, I, I never understood what, when people said you came from Bergen, I'm not sure what that meant. They always <laughs> was snide about people from Bergen. But um, I am indebted to the Norwegian home and the Norwegian community. Um, they um, raised me and they had a scholarship fund. Eventually it closed and there's now a Norwegian scholarship fund that's open to anybody of Norwegian heritage. Um, our assets were liquidated and, and put into a, a stock fund. So you may want to think of this one day if you have children of college age, there is money given out every year for the past at least 20, 25 years now. But um, I just wanted to uh, say that it was um, a, quite an experience to learn of so much and to be immersed in the Norwegian culture. The language, the food, and the traditions um, were still alive and they're still alive in my heart. 
Thank you. Uh, Keith, good to talk to you. Uh, thanks for contributing. Uh, yes, if I if I could add to that, uh, well, uh, actually, my uh, we we're talking tonight about my father, but actually, my mother, uh, she was in the Norwegian Children's Home for a little bit because my grandmother uh, died prematurely at, during the Great Depression, and so my grandfather had no way to take care of all the kids by himself. So she, she and her siblings spent some time in the Norwegian Children's Home in the late in the 1930s. So we're indebted to them as well. And I just want to echo the, uh, the scholarship for anyone who has children between ages of 18 and 23 years old, if they're going to college, um, all you have to do is prove 25, at least 25% Norwegian ancestry and uh, you, it's a very good chance uh, you'll get a, a, a little scholarship of about a thousand dollars or so. Um, so I know my children have taken advantage of it. So I encourage others to apply if you're in that same uh, situation. Okay, very good, thank you. I, um... what, what is that scholarship listed under? Um, it, Norwegian Children's uh, a Home. I think if you just uh, Google it, you'll you'll get to it. Um, unfortunately, I think their application process for like the next year it usually ends about March fifteenth to get your application in. It's a pretty simple application, um, but the tricky part is proving your twenty five percent Norwegian heritage. So if, I know for a lot of people, they may now be like third or, or fourth generation Norwegian. And so, you know, those original documents when, when, your parent, when your ancestors originally came and settled in, you know, Iowa or, or wherever has is, is long <laughs> been uh, discarded. But uh, for those that are able to prove that, it's, it's a relatively easy scholarship to get. Okay, very interesting. Bill, I have a question for Keith. This is Carolyn Collins. Keith, yes. can you hear me? Keith. Yes. Did you know Herman Nielsen while you were in the children's home? My father was president of the children's home, probably around the time you were talking about. Do you remember Herman Nielsen? Yes, I, 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 I remember the name. I'm just trying to put the face in, uh, in, in there, and it's... Um, Again, uh, the people, the Norwegian community really, really stepped up with their right. country, their time. And thank you for having him there for us because- um, Years and years working and being on the board. It was uh, amazing what they did with uh, running that bazaar and raising money. Uh, did, uh, he work, did he work for AT&T? Was he- Yeah, is that, he was um, in uh, marine refrigeration. He was in his own business in uh, New York. I was uh, you know, raised there and uh, okay. remember the home on 85th Street. We lived right. on- I, we I think it was Emil Borga. Borga was there at that time. Where okay. they, and I think Herman Nielsen was there too. Yeah, so, I'm sure. I'm sure. Wonderful, I'm, wonderful I'm, people nice to, to get their time. Tonight, Keith. Thank you, everybody. It was great. Thank you for, for telling me that. Thank you. So, um, uh, could I say something, Bill? I just yeah. wanted to say um, so many uh, Americans, about 4 million Americans, are of Norwegian descent in this country as a result of. 800,000 immigrants coming over here, mostly in the 19th century. Back then, Norway was very poor. They call it Stockars Lilla Norga, you know, poor little Norway. And now all of a sudden, with all of this money that it's gotten from the, from the, the oil in the North Seas, it has become one of the richest places in the world. So it's a real uh, change from Stockars Lilla Norga. So that's all. Yeah, it, it's rather impressive. It's not simply the money 
but also Norway, uh, uh, a lot of countries have gotten oil money and they never really invested, used it properly and it created more problems than benefits. But Norway has been very financially responsible in dealing with the oil revenues and setting up the, uh, I think it's the Norwegian National Fund, which is now over a trillion dollars, which is um, pretty impressive for a country of uh, just over 5 million people. Uh, uh, it's the world's largest sovereign wealth fund. This, and it's owned by a country of just 5 million people. So they've got it. They were so smart. I mean, so many other places just would have said, you know, um, we'll abolish taxes and just give you a check each year. Instead of Norway, they just banked it. Yeah. They banked all that oil money. And so it's a backstop forever for, for their state. Mm -hmm. And it was just amazing long-term thinking. Yes. Yeah, it's very, yeah, it's very, there's a number of books um, on uh, Norway and Norwegian econ economics, uh, Viking eco e economics and how, uh, Norway has uh, been sort of a model on how to manage that type of money. Um, so uh, I was impressed, uh, uh, John, with your, your father's uh, willingness to take on the bureaucracies uh, and uh, uh, help other people. I guess it, one of the things is the, the Merchant Marine, you have a, a strong sense of solidarity uh, not only with the, the uh, his fellow sailors, but with their families and everything. Would you say that's a general with the Norwegian Merchant Marine? Well, yeah, he was certainly raised in a, in a culture there that, I mean, he came from, what's interesting is um, toward the end of his life, he was very involved with that sort of diplomatic world. And they had a big uh, event at the uh, Waldorf when the uh, uh, 50th anniversary of the liberation of Norway. And uh, it was a big evening. Celeste Holm was the MC and all. And he was part of the planning committee. I had to take him to this a few times. And so they said to me, your father really has a, we could tell you come from well-to-do people in Norway, and which was absolutely not the case. And he said, uh, and she, I said, well, why do you feel that? And they said, well, he, he has such knowledge of, of table wines and, and table etiquette. And that's his three years as a cabin boy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> So I think when you come up from the ranks, you, when you come through the ranks, you, you, you feel close to the rest of them. And, and the Norwegians had a system like that where basically you started in the, in the, and worked your way up. So you knew basically uh, almost every job on that ship. And then, then you went to the officer school. But there was also this feeling that the officers were supposed to look after the, uh, the sailors. And so I think when, when a lot of this stuff started to come together in the late 60s and 70s, he was one of the few um, officers that were still alive you know, from the wartime. I mean, the, the war was, but like, and, and it was, um, uh, he had a great partner in my mother who had been heavily involved with this Nortra ship, which is something we can talk about next time. I mean, how this consortium of shipping is organized is pretty fascinating. Uh, and probably the biggest shipping company ever in the world was Nortra ship. And, and it had its Manhattan offices uh, down in Broadway, uh, right off of what's called Steamship Row. But there was a feeling that the officers were supposed to look after the, the men even afterwards. So. Like he tried uh, to visit the surviving families and things like that. You know, he was in a port where there was somebody, he tried to go see them. Um, and so later, I think he also felt this, this sense of, because uh, uh, the truth is they, early in his game, when he started to have success winning these back cases and back pays and things like that, um, one of the diplomats gave him a really hard time uh, about it and said, uh, you're not having too much success here. And, and, I hated that they were going to investigate him and this kind of stuff. But, you know, these old Norwegian captains were, he was not the guy to kind of cross like that. I mean, he, he just came right back at him and said, look, let's make it as personal, you know. And then later that diplomat became a great friend of, of the movement and, the, and got behind the veterans. So I think, I think he was the right person. And then his, his, um, his own case was so special. And so, you know, that if you were going to deny him a pension, um, then who was, who was going to get one kind of deal you know, with this disability aspect. So, and, and his health definitely, I mean, the, the medical stuff was certainly there, the bills and everything. So um, I think he felt this kinship with, with the rank and file and the, and the families in particular, they were, um, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the home was one aspect of Norwegian's children's home, but, but, you know, there was a lot of social services that uh, 
Uh, Norway was a poor country that they couldn't provide. Um, so it was a lot of, I guess you'd say, volunteers uh, is, historically. And certainly that Siemens Church, I mean, Phil may want to say something. See, Siemens Church was uh, kind of a unity thing in New York, particularly. Phil, did you? Yeah, um, yeah it was um, a, a, a spiritual base for uh, many of these seamen when they're dealing with, um, you know, very tough issues of, you know, life and death and all. But it also served as social services. So they provided housing. They provided almost, it was like the USO, I guess, would yeah. maybe be a close analogy. Um, little entertainment that, so that, that one thing is that they tried to prevent was, you know, having all these sailors go, you know, waste all their money away in bars and stuff like that. So they would have social events, more have a little bit more uh, control. Um, uh, seamen could also uh, bank their pay during the war at, you know, kind of the seamen's share, hold it in trust for, for them uh, for a while. So it, it provided a wide range of services. In, in fact, um, even though my father, towards the end of the war, he was declared not fit for war, for war duty anymore or for sea duty, um, he still wanted to do something. So one of the roles he did in New York was he he was like the resident assistant at one of the Siemens Church houses. Um, you know, again, like a college, like a college RA person, <laughs> you know, making yeah. sure, you know, <laughs> lights out and, uh, you know, if someone didn't return at, you know, by curfew that, you know, you go try to find them and stuff like that. So. <laughs> uh, one thing I think is either Phil, you said it or John said it, that uh, when a ship was sunk and the people would spend a certain amount of days in a lifeboat, they would dock that out of the vacation pay. Did I hear that correctly? Yeah, that's, that's, that's unfortunately true. It was taken from your annual leave. Uh, um, and uh, I remember my father talking about this vividly a few times that, uh, I mean, one of the reasons he actually, my father met my mother, he, he had to, after the shrinking, the ship, the blink was sunk in 42, um, he needed some documentation to get some back pay for time he was owed. So he went to the office of Northrop ship in Manhattan and, and my mother was sort of the keeper of the, the sinking reports. So he asked for a copy so he could document his time. And um, she said, it's a wartime, it's, it's a confidential document. And of course he had written it. So he, he said, I, you know, I deserve to see that. And they had a big, uh, they had a big fight, and uh, and then he came back and took her out to this Leon and Eddie's nightclub. So <laughs> I guess he got access to the report and his back. <laughs> one way, or, <laughs> one way or another, but yeah. that has to be the worst vacation ever. <laughs> it's not only what you know; it's who you know. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So uh, that could I just say something about the Norwegian um, Siemens churches. Um, many years ago, I was a student in Germany, in Hamburg, Germany. And I visited the Norwegian Siemens Church in Hamburg. And it's a, it's a very nice thing, very near the harbor. But like you said, uh, with regard to New York City, uh, the Norwegian merchant or, or Siemens Church was really uh, the place where the whole Norwegian community in that city met. So I went to church there once on a Sunday morning. And um, so there were all the local businessmen there and their children, the diplomats, you know, plus the seamen. And I think that these um, seamen's churches and must be, I mean, I just have two data points here, I guess, New York and Hamburg, but they must be sort of meeting places for the communities. It'd be interesting to know how many of these seamen's churches there are around the world for Norway. That's all. Yeah. Well, the one in Manhattan is sort of dual purpose. It moved from Brooklyn to uh, to uh, the Upper East Side, not too far from the United Nations. So it serves a, a major diplomatic function as well as exactly what you're saying. It's a cultural center. Um, I mean, there's still rooms and stuff there for seamen, I guess, if they need to stay. There's some small apartments and that type of thing. But uh, it's mainly a, a very much a religious and social function. But And I recommend it if you've got... Um, if your children have married, you know, other, uh, other children of a different religion, uh, we were trying to get, uh, all, of, all of my grandchildren ended up being christened in the Norwegian Siemens Church in Manhattan. And 
part of it was, um, they said, well, what, what religion is that? And I said, well, that's the religion of the Norwegian seamen, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, I and it's like, you know, we're all on a long voyage and we're all gonna look out for each other. And uh, we're looking for that big shore leave at the end, you know, and, uh, and everybody was sort of comfortable with, because it's a very welcoming place. And uh, although it's Lutheran, but um, it, it basically, uh, uh, and it turned out to be a destination uh, if you're thinking about a christening, I recommend it because I had no trouble getting families. Oh, Upper East Side, Manhattan. I mean, this is before COVID, of course. Uh, you know, people would travel there and take a room in a hotel and say, oh, I'm in town for the christening, you know. Um, so it's like, uh, <laughs> but it's a very good, neutral, uh, wholesome kind of place. I want to uh, yeah. add something here. Can you hear me, Bill? Sure. Okay. Um, I really enjoy hearing about Brooklyn. Well, the whole program tonight was excellent. Compliment to all of your speakers. It's been very educational. When you're getting down to Brooklyn, when I first came to America, uh, we moved to Brooklyn. And my parents were the directors of the Norwegian senior home in Brooklyn, 1257 67th Street. And it's surrounded by an Italian neighborhood. And I was trying to learn Norwegian and I was picking up Italian. <laughs> but, uh, we spent, my parents were Methodist, and we did spend a lot of time in the Norwegian Seaman Home. It was a fellowship gathering. We also belonged to the, uh, or went to the uh, Bethlehem uh, Methodist uh, Church in Brooklyn, and Battleship Church. But at, in the uh, Seaman Home, my father as a Methodist, and it was Lutheran, did a lot of sermons down there and participated in a lot of programs, especially at Christmas time. And as a young child, I would not want to be sitting in the service all the time. So when the congregation would stand up to sing, I would sneak out and run back to where the seamen were that weren't in the church and play games with them. And whether it was ping pong or whatever they were doing, they were a lot of fun. I spent several years there uh, growing up with them, and they're a wonderful group of people, and the whole organization is fantastic. So, okay. compliments to all of you. They had part of it. I think Caroline, her father was director of the children's home, and we spent a lot of time there as well. So, very good. Yeah. Thank you all. Uh, Jorget, did you have um, no, uh, have any comments that you want to add? Uh, just about the uh, Siemens Church. I mean, there's, they closed quite a few of them. Uh, I think this. Two other, in, I think it's in Houston. There's one, and there's one on the West Coast also, I believe. The the one in um, here in Philadelphia is closed, and I don't know about the one in Baltimore. It might be one uh, in when New we live in England. <laughs> Sorry, I think there might be one in New Orleans. There, that could be. be I'm not there's sure. a big one I, I in New Orleans. I, uh, we did travel around the United States our first couple of years, and driving, and we would make a point of stopping along the Seaman churches from uh, South Carolina, Charleston, hmm. and uh, into Florida and into New Orleans. They had a big one down there. And of course, closer here in Virginia, the Norfolk, it's a big one. Um, I don't know how many there are, but I know there's a lot of them have closed. We lived in England for five years. And uh, just as uh, was mentioned earlier, it has become sort of a uh, cultural thing. So. My wife being from New York, uh, but uh, we went to that Norwegian Seamus Church in uh, in London all the time. And uh, my, I have to admit, my main reason for doing it was because I wanted our kids to be able to speak Norwegian. Uh, well, they ended up going to Norwegian schools, so they actually became fluent in Norwegian. But uh, it's, it's, it was a great, uh, it's called uh, uh, King Olaf's uh, Church, and uh, it's uh, quite a nice old church and um, very picturesque. And they had some... Uh, it was a great cultural center. It really was a lot of fun to go there, and they had great Christmas parties. The, our kids always wanted to go there, so it's it's a good institution. They set that up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, well, if you believe what you read on the internet, it seems like the Norwegian Siemens churches in America left are San Francisco, you know, Miami, New York, and New Orleans. Mm -hmm. So not too many left. Mm -hmm. You know, they have financial, there are financial issues because the Norwegian government no longer 
subsidizes the, Nor the Church of Norway and the Norwegian Siemens Church, which is an affiliate. So, you know, the, the, uh, the financial issues can be pretty daunting. And, and, this, and the merchants fleet, as we talked about earlier, so much smaller. And uh, they were the ones who, of course, who supported the most, gave the biggest contributions, so all the shipping companies. Uh -huh. And uh, there's few of them left, so. Okay. I think if we do a part two on this, I think the, the Nortra ship and the Norwegian shipping companies are uh, something we should talk a little bit about uh, in part two, because my father was always in awe of ship owners. I mean, they were the most influential people in Norway back in the... Uh -huh. Uh, uh, and all, and, and uh, but certainly of time of the war and, and 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 immediately after the ship owners had tremendous influence, um, and I mean there's kind of a, a real challenge for them. They get organized in a consortium called Nortra Ship, but both the British government uh, and the Norwegian government in exile wanted to take the fleets over. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's a but these are pretty savvy businessmen who are used to doing work around the world, and so this this commercial aspect comes together. Uh, but of course, they, they, they do produce a lot of revenue for the Norwegian government, too, um, uh -huh. through the shipping. But so I think it's something we may want to talk about. Sounds uh, good to me. Yeah. yeah. OK, just a nice segue. I just want to remind everyone we are going to continue this discussion. We uh, originally had thought of one meeting, but we when we started doing the planning, we figured there's so much there. We want to have two meetings and the next meeting will be, um, uh, I think that is April 13th. Um, so I always like to ch double check. Yes, that will be Tuesday, April 13th, 7 p.m. We will have the continuation with our uh, three speakers and they're going to, uh, we're going to be talking about the uh, Norwegian shipping companies and other topics. and going into details about more individual um, incidents. And uh, again, also your questions and concerns. If you have anything you want to bring up, uh, like your family's experience or someone in your family's experience, uh, please give me an email uh, and I'll make sure that, uh, you know, uh, that that's included, so. Anyone want to have a um, sort of last call? Anyone have any final comments? Just thanks a lot, a lot to all of you for a very good presentation. Well, you're very welcome. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I thought thank it was very you. good too. Yes. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank everybody for joining, and I hope look forward to seeing you everyone on April 13th uh, for the continuation of this talk. So thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you much. Bye-bye. Thank you.